welcome to one of our casual conversations in our Breaking Down Barriers story, talking about observational studies. These are an important role in, in understanding Huntington's disease and the community at large. And this is one of those rare diseases where there are many different opportunities to participate in an observational study. So I am joined with some of the heavy hitters in the research community globally to talk a little bit more about some, uh, some of the concerns around observational studies, uh, questions that we get from the community, and what some of those observational studies are, and more importantly, how you can get involved. So I'm going to turn it over to our panel and uh, to introduce themselves, and we'll get right into the conversation. So first of all, I want to uh, introduce Jamie within Roll HD. Jamie Levy. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Levy. I and the co-leader of the clinical research platform, which really is en the enrolled study at its core, but it also serves as a platform for other observational studies. Um, the, the platform's been up and running since 2012. We just, we're now celebrating our 10 year anniversary. Hope everyone can celebrate with us. Um, and I'm also from a Huntington's disease family, which is why I got involved in this organization so that I can do my utmost to contribute. Fantastic. Thanks for being here. And another Jamie, Jamie Hamilton from Enroll as well. Uh, hello, everyone. Jamie Hamilton. I am a science director of clinical outcome assessments at CHDI. Um, I sit in the clinical outcome team. So we're very committed to advancing clinical research for therapeutic development um, dedicated towards CHD and advancing that area. And it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. Thank you. Ed Wild. Hi, I'm Ed. I'm a professor of neurology at University College London, associate director of the UCL Huntington's Disease Centre, and I am a doctor seeing patients in the clinic. I've been doing observational research in Huntington's disease since 2005, and since roughly 2017, I've been the chief investigator of a study called HD Clarity, which uses the Enroll HD platform and builds on it to um, collect what is already the world's biggest ever resource of cerebrospinal fluid and blood and data from Huntington's disease uh, family members and um, controls. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Lauren Byrne. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Byrne. I'm a senior research fellow at University College London. I also sit on the board of HDGO. I wear many hats in the HD community, so I'm a HD family member. Um, I also have been working in observational research um, with Ed Wild um, back since uh, 2015. Um, and in the last few years, I've been working with HDO to set up a registry for juvenile onset Huntington's disease called Join HD, which I'm the chief investigator of. Great. And Sherry? Hi, everyone. I'm Sherry Cannell. I'm the CEO of the Huntington Study Group. Um, and we are an organization that has a mission, and our mission is to seek treatments that make a difference for those affected by HD. And currently, we are running um, two observational studies that are um, allowing people to participate in studies virtually. We have a platform called My, My, um, My HD Story, um, where we're running an observational study where people are reporting um, how they feel about their disease in their own words. And we're also running um, a study called Virtual UHDRS. And that's a study to help um, participants to be able to be assessed using um, an assessment tool that's used in clinical trials called the Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale to be able to be assessed um, from their homes. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to answer more questions about those later. Thanks, Sherry. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Karen Anderson. Hi, sorry to be joining late. Um, I'm a neuropsychiatrist at Georgetown University, and I am the PI of the My HD story that uh, Sherry mentioned with the Huntington Study Group. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for being here. We know that you uh, are busy individuals, so we appreciate the effort to educate the community. Um, I wanted to really start by breaking down the basics of what is an observational study in research and why is it important that the community participates? And I'd love it to open up to anybody who'd like to start. 
no takers. I, I'm leaving the floor to Ed because he's so good at all this. <laughs> I know I'll talk too much. If I answer the first question, then I'll just keep talking. So someone else answer that question. I guess well, I, I can... I, I'll answer. Oh, go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> you could all be English, just so polite. <laughs> I nominate Lauren. I second that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess most simply um, why it's observational research is because that is simply what we're doing is observing people that have Huntington's disease or carry the gene for Huntington's disease and those that don't and seeing if we can detect any differences. Um, I think that's the most basic explanation why we call it observational research. Um, and a key difference is compared to other clinical research things that we call clinical trials. Um, um, that's where the big kind of difference is where we're trialing a um, compound or a potential drug to see if, uh, compare whether people on the drug or are not on the drug, um, if there are any differences. So that I think is the key difference. Um, maybe someone else wants to answer, answer why that observational is so important. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we um, those of us who are clinicians get experience seeing patients, we may form opinions about what's important to patients and what, um, what symptoms are very common in HD, but I think that observational studies uh, give us the chance to collect this in information systematically. It may surprise us when we find out, you know, what symptoms are actually more re represented in the population. And also, it does expand research uh, to those who aren't able to participate or don't want to participate in a clinical trial. It does give them a way to be part of uh, the HD research community. And then, of course, it gives um, our sponsors in the pharmaceutical industry a better idea of what changes in HD, how it does, what may stay the same, so they can uh, plan their interventional studies accordingly. So I just want to add one more thing. So um, when we also do observational studies um, to try and find out why people want to participate or don't want to participate in clinical research. And as Karen said, that helps inform companies to um, build their trials and design their trials so that it, it takes into account what's important to patients and participants and caregivers. Um, so for example, um, we ran a study called Project AWARE where it um, tried to find out why people wanna participate, awareness, willingness, and ability. And we learned a lot of things about it and it kind of put it, when you do an observational study with the, um, that is a, a validated um, observational study with the IRB and, um, and um, with a PI, we, we be, are able to publish on that and it becomes really a valid report of what the outcome is. And what happened is, is that we learned that people really like to have Saturday visits. We learned that um, people don't wanna have as many uh, visits with the caregiver as possible. And so we informed um, and we also learned that people like to have certain things at the site to make their visit um, palatable and enjoyable. And so we actually had companies implement these things based on what people said was important to them. So um, we, you know, it really does inform companies on how to design their trials. So I just wanted to add that. Can I just comment on what, what may be a, a myth or a misconception about observational trials as well, which I think is important, which is that there's, you know, I see a lot of patients and they, they they say, I want to be in a trial. I want to be in a drug trial. Okay. And of course, that's a common thing to want because you want to be on the front line and you want to test something that might treat Huntington's disease. And you want to be the person who takes the pill that's the cure. But actually where those trials come from is an understanding of the science and the biology of Huntington's disease. And some of the most important insights that we have into how Huntington's disease affects the human brain and the human body come from observational studies that have, that have taken place in the past 10, 20, 30 years for which HD family members have um, volunteered. And really so, the, and, and I think it's really important to emphasize that to us as scientists, those contributions that those family members have made to observational trials are no less important 
than the contributions of people who take part in drug trials. For instance, the biggest phase three drug trial we've ever run in HD was about 800 people. The Enroll HD study, as I uh, when I last heard, was over 25,000 people. So is, um, and the amount of information that those 25,000 people have told us already in the first 10 years of Enroll has given us a bunch of new drug targets, given the drug companies way, new ways of thinking about how to treat Huntington's disease. And every time they want to set up a clinical trial, the first thing they do is look at the database from the observational studies and say, how does Huntington's behave? How, how, what's the best group of people for me to test my drug on? How many of these people are there? What are the sites that I can go to? So observational studies really are the kind of foundation on which we build clinical trials. And also a great way to, to figure out whether a clinical trial of a drug is right for you is to take part in an observational trial. And if you get on okay with that, then maybe the next step would be a, a clinical trial of a drug. I think that's really important to understand the the ways that they work together and the importance of it. And also, I know some of the other outcomes that, especially with our juvenile onset initiative for HD, join HD, is to also understand where there are gaps in support, which we know that there are several with JOHD families. So how can we better address support uh, programs and ways based off of those unmet needs that they describe? And so it's a great combination of the science behind it, but then also the quality of life and how that plays into how the science needs to be designed and support programs. And it really comes full circle. So this is hugely important. So thank you all for that perspective. I want to kind of jump more to the community perspective of it. Lauren and Jamie being community members in the Huntington's disease community, uh, being family members, how has it been? I know that uh, at least Lauren, you've participated in observational studies, but what has it meant to you all coming from families? Uh, and so as Jamie, coming, coming from families impacted by HD to have something to fight back with, some way to participate, even not if you can participate in a specific clinical trial, but in observational studies. I think it's affected me in two aspects, two ways. So, um, before coming to UCL, um, my previous experience with healthcare professionals and things like that were not great when it came to Huntington's disease. Um, back in Ireland, there's not a lot of people that understand the disease. Um, and I think that's the case for a lot of families that are impacted by this disease. The isolation and lack of knowledge can be so crippling to these families and make them feel so isolated and um, powerless. Um, to come to somewhere like UCL, which is one of the world leading centers and, and take part in research and be part of that actually team that's doing the research. Um, it, the feeling that it is to actually talk to people that get the disease and um, understand it is, it is really, it's hard to put into words what that feeling is like when you have years of, of lack of understanding and then families and friends that don't get what's going on at home or, or things like that, to come to a center where people, you don't have to explain anything to them, they understand. That was a um, really life-changing for me. Um, the other aspect is, as well is just feeling that you can take some control back. Um, I think um, when you're at risk for Huntington's disease or anything like that, I'm, I'm G negative now, but before that, I can feel very, um, like you have no control of your situation. So one thing I, th I know um, other um, young people that I've spoken to felt the same, that being able to take part in research and be um, face Huntington's head on is, is extremely important in, in how they move forward with their future um, compared to the, the generations before. Um, I know that's a big kind of mission of HDO as well, is, is hopefully raising a generation that has, don't have to kind of meet HD with as much fear as the generations before us and maybe Jamie, Jamie can add to that. I would agree with Lauren. I think I find it very empowering and it allows any family member, especially young people, because a lot of times you're not thinking about yourself, you're a caregiver and you haven't really even considered what it means to be affected yourself. But this gives you, the observational studies gives an opportunity to really get accustomed to being in an HD family with the right type of professional support and community support that you wouldn't normally find or acquire in another setting. 
And I also see it as a training ground. I think Ed had said, if people come and they want to join clinical trials, well, the best way to get into clinical trials is to get used to conduct, being in research studies. And the best way to do that is to do it in a way that isn't so time consuming, you know, maybe an annual visit or some, you know, twice a year, some sort of visit, because you wouldn't be going for clinical visits if you're not affected by the disease, unless you're accompanying a parent or a sibling, someone that's affected. So it's, it's a really good training ground to get used to, get involved like an entree to clinical research in a way that's really benign and very welcoming. And it does make you feel good because you're doing something, you're taking control, you're helping your family member, you're helping yourself one day, even if you don't wanna know if you carry the gene, you don't have to, you can still be involved in observational studies in many of them. I think that welcoming component is so important because I feel like, especially with young people who maybe haven't ever gone to a clinic, there is this kind of sterile feeling that you might have entering the clinic environment, but really you are comforted so much by these professionals who care about you as people and who want to see you um, grow and learn more and be empowered and, and to participate further. So I think that that's a really important piece from what you said, Jamie, too, is just that the community includes the scientific community, including people who facilitate these observational studies, and they do often become extended family members. Absolutely. We have multi-generational relationships with our clinic peak leaders and the people there. It's wonderful, actually, and it makes a big, big difference on a lifetime relationship. Mm -hmm. you know, they can talk about your parents, your grandparents sometimes. It's really very interesting. That's amazing. That's fantastic to hear. So what are some, we kind of mentioned a little bit of this, but I'd love to dive deeper into some of the, the observational studies that you all help facilitate or have in the past. And I'd love to start off with Enroll because that is currently the largest um, observational study and really has been such a groundwork for clinical trials. Do you want to chat a little bit about Enroll specifically, some of the, the goals and outcomes uh, and just what you all have been able to achieve? Um, Enroll is an open-ended observational study where family members, whether you're at risk or a caregiver, or you already know you're gene negative, or you know what you're, you are a gene expansion carrier, or you're early manifest, you know, symptomatic of the disease, you come in for an annual visit that really mirrors the clinical visit at times. A lot of these types of assessments, whether they're cognitive or behavioral or motor testing, is similar to what you would do in a typical clinical visit. And you come, it's a, an hour or two, depending the first visit, it's probably longer, the first baseline visit, we call it. And you conduct a number of motor assessments and the unified Huntington's disease rating scale that Shari alluded, talked about. The, you do a, a behavioral assessment that talks about your mood and your feelings. And then there are a number of cognitive tests that some are fun, like puzzles, some are a little annoying, but you know, they're, 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 they're easy to take on. And as I said, you get accustomed to it. And that data is all de-identified. It all goes into a database, a system that doesn't identify who you are as a person, it gets a code, and then it becomes the larger database. And that's how we, that's what we can provide for to researchers who want to explore data mine, we call it, the data to come up with potential ideas on how to create new assessments or how to create, how to develop new drugs. So I think the clinical outcomes is really important. It's something that's really critical at the earliest or pre-manifest pre at-risk levels of Huntington's disease. So I think I'll leave it to, to Jamie to talk about some of the clinical outcome measures that are important for the younger people, primarily, for the youngest people. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. That was a great segue. Um, one of the things that's very, uh, you know, of interest to the clinical outcomes teams is understanding what kind of changes are happening earlier in the stages of progression. And so uh, there was a, one uh, project, the first 2.0, which is a scale that was developed to evaluate and assess functional changes earlier in kind of the trajectory of, of the disease course. Um, and so we've been doing some work around, um, you know, collecting as much data and information around functional change along the disease trajectory. 
Um, and this will allow us to validate this measure and hopefully have it incorporated into your HD clinical trials. And this is really, really important um, because we want to be able to detect earlier changes um, in the disease, disease course and not necessarily rely on um, just the motor diagnosis. We want to do this before motor, motor diagnosis is actually um, being evaluated and obviously determined. Um, another project that we have is assessing and evaluating indirect and out-of-pocket costs associated with HD progression. And this is a huge challenge and impact um, because things that are not tied to our medical claims, a lot of individuals, both care partners, as well as individuals with HD are incurring a lot of costs to manage and treat their symptoms. And so understanding what those costs may look like for that individual can really be quite helpful when we're thinking about um, drugs getting close to becoming available in kind of the post-market space, but it also helps us to understand what's the best place along the disease course to intervene. And so this can be really, really helpful in terms of shaping policy. Um, it can help us in terms of uh, shaping and understanding, um, you know, from a therapeutic development standpoint, but also from an intervention standpoint about what things um, may be a burden to individuals with HD as well as their care partners. Um, those are two that I'm thinking off the top of mind, and there are various stages, but two examples of observational, um, no intervention, but really evaluating and collecting information on those two kind of important areas of both function as well as indirect and out-of-pocket costs. And I think the fact that Enroll is global, so you can gain those perspectives because there are similar experiences and stories, but it changes in each country for how that access and um, care is needed. And especially when you talk about policy changes and things like that. So that's, I think, really invaluable to understand the full scope um, as best as possible for what living in a family impacted by HD means um, in, in several different countries. We do a lot of this by you know, we've involved with lay associations as well, because it's hard to be in every country because the respective healthcare infrastructures are, are unique, very different. We tend to start in English language areas and expand from there. But I know there are similar type projects happening locally in different countries, depending, you know, who takes charge of those type of projects. Some of them are funded by the pharmaceutical industry as they prepare to have a drug approved, hopefully. So there are some projects look, looking at costs and access to healthcare. Um, but I would say overall, the Enroll platform, just through the data collection, supports so many of these various activities, and it is the ultimate entree into research for anyone interested in doing something about being affected or touched by Huntington's disease. And is it a problem if people participate in Enroll and then also participate in other observational studies, thinking that there are country-specific, site-specific studies that might be happening in, um, in tandem with, with Enroll? Not at all. We actually encourage that. That's the concept of the platform, whether it's something that's on our platform or not. People should participate in as many studies as they can, observational, if they're not ready for clinical trials or they're, they're not able to meet the criteria for clinical trials because they're not sick or they're not symptomatic. So they should participate unless there's a specific exclusionary reason not to participate. They should do as much as they can. That's why surveys are so important because it doesn't take that much time and you can get involved, do it online. And we're hoping to see more and more of that kind of activities where people can take advantage from the comfort of their home mm -hmm. and not necessarily have to go to clinic. But it is good to go to clinic and get involved in these studies because we'd like people to donate samples, you know, whether it's plasma or the cerebral spinal fluid like Ed's study, HD Clarity. This is so critical to Huntington's disease research. And I won't say it's so easy to do, but it, it's just a day or half a day, and they should step up and, and try to donate samples because that's where a lot of the basic research happens. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's kind of a great segue. Ed, if you want to talk about what you all are doing with HD Clarity. Sure. So HD Clarity is a, a study built on the Enroll HD platform, uh, and it's focused mainly on this stuff called cerebrospinal fluid or spinal fluid. Um, and this is a clear fluid that's produced deep in the brain and it kind of surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. And there's a lot of stuff in that fluid that came from the brain um, and can't be accessed through any other easy means. So, um, you know, you may be familiar with the idea of having a blood test to look at your cholesterol and that predicts your future risk of heart attacks. 
that's called a biomarker because that's a measurement that can tell you something about your health uh, in the future. Um, and what we're looking for is biomarkers that help us understand and treat Huntington's disease. And ideally what we've been looking for this whole time is brain stuff uh, in, in easily accessible bodily fluids such as blood or urine or cerebrospinal fluid. And it, it, what's emerged so far is that this, the CSF is a really valuable source of information about the brain that we can't get anywhere else. Now, needless to say, it's not the easiest fluid in the world to collect. Um, you have to have a procedure called a lumbar puncture, sometimes known as a spinal tap. Um, and if those are words that strike fear into the heart of people listening, don't worry. That's what everyone feels like the first time they hear about these things. Um, but in practice, um, many people's impression of what a lumbar puncture is comes from watching medical dramas or having a friend or relative who's had to go to the emergency room and have it done in the middle of the night because someone thought they might have had a brain hemorrhage. When we do a lumbar puncture for HD research, it is not like that. It's done by some of the most experienced doctors and nurses in, in the world at doing these procedures. It's done under extremely controlled circumstances. We often have classical music playing in the background and um, it's everyone's everyone's there to contribute to research. So the atmosphere is a lot, is a lot um, calmer and um, I'm not saying it's a walk in the park for everybody. Sometimes it's tricky, but on the whole, it's an extremely safe and well-tolerated procedure. And what it gives us is 20 milliliters of this clear fluid that looks a bit like tap water or gin, if you're me. And um, that fluid contains this invaluable information and it can be used for developing new biomarkers or seeing how the biomarkers we already have can be used to track the disease, predict the progression of the disease, and then rolled out into clinical trials. So HD Clarity has been running for five years. We have around about 700 samples in the freezer or samples from 700 people, but each of those samples is about 65 individual little uh, vials of CSF, which can be sent to scientists from the academic world, the research world, or the pharmaceutical world to help them set up trials, develop new drugs, and develop uh, new biomarkers. We have, I think, 28 sites around the world, um, and uh, more sites are opening every month. Needless to say, COVID had a bit of an impact on getting people into hospital for this kind of work, but we're, I'm pleased to say we're now fully recovered from COVID. We're back to pre-COVID recruitment levels, which is awesome. And um, a really important part of HD Clarity is that we need younger people and people from um, HD families who uh, may be uh, not experienced symptoms of the disease yet so what you know what we might think of as being far from onset because what we really want to be is in the business of preventing Huntington's disease and in order to do that we're going to have to have a really good idea of what the biomarkers that we're developing look like in people who are many years from uh, the expected time where they might de develop symptoms in the future because if we can keep things at those sort of healthy levels using a drug which prevents them from rising towards the more Huntington's disease type levels then that's how we will start to know that we may be doing something meaningful to um, slow the progression of Huntington's or even prevent it so that's HD Clarity in a slightly large nutshell um, I, I, what I would say is um, you in order to be Part of HD Clarity, because it's built on the Enroll HD platform, we need we need people to sign up at Enroll HD sites. If your if your clinical site has Enroll HD but not HD Clarity, ask about whether Clarity might be on the way um, and what you might be able to do to sort of help get HD Clarity up and running. And sometimes people can go from one Enroll HD site to another to have a Clarity sampling visit. So there is a bit of flexibility there if 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 Clarity's not yet up and running at your site and um every single donation is immensely valuable and and we've already given dozens of lots of samples out to uh, dozens of um requesters who have used them to um do some incredible hd science i have my uh, hd clarity lumbar puncture on friday with professor ed Weil yeah, <laughs> stabbing me in the days, back two and a half days um, and that's months. my third lumbar puncture for hd research so I've not only convinced over 80 people to have multiple lumbar punctures, I've also had myself taken part and they're not as scary as they're told to be or said to be. We're also going to do another breaking down barriers, barriers conversation around lumbar punctures because we know that it can be a little bit daunting to think about, but Lauren has that unique perspective of administering and receiving them for different studies. So uh, we're definitely going to 
pun intended, pick her brain a little bit with what that experience has been like and how we can spread, kind of break down some of those stigmas around it. I've had four, by the way, not that it's a competition, but Lauren's, oh my God. <laughs> Lauren's hot on my heels. I'm going to have four if I do my repeat one in a few months time, and then I'll have my fifth one for Yaz in a year or two. So it's not a competition. <laughs> it's a competition I'm happy for you to win. <laughs> Sherry and Karen, do you want to talk about some of the observational studies happening at HSG? Sure, I will start with the one that I mentioned before, my HD story. So this is a study that is, uh, we're currently doing a pilot study that's open to people who have an HD diagnosis. And the great thing is it's completely from the comfort of your own home. So this is a study that you can do on your computer we actually have an app under development that will be available soon also. Um, so you can do it, you know, when you want to, when it's comfortable for you um, and at your own schedule. You can do part of it, uh, come back another day and finish it. Uh, so completely unlike a research visit in a clinical center where it's on someone else's schedule and you have to do it on the days they're available and all the other barriers that uh, that we've talked about. And the reason that this study is important is that it's helping us to understand how people with HD experience it in their own words. Um, as I mentioned before, talking about priorities, I've been an HD clinician for many years. I have my own opinions about what matters in HD, what symptoms are very severe, but I'm not living with HD the way that many people are. So, you know, finding out what symptoms people really prioritize, how they talk about them, we can use that information to help regulators and sponsors and others understand, you know, this symptom actually matters to people with HD. We should elevate it in terms of its importance. This is the way people talk about their symptoms themselves. This is the kind of language that you should use in a questionnaire for a clinical trial if you want to really um, you know, get a good understanding of what people experience and have them understand what you're asking, um, as opposed to questionnaires that are made up of you know, a panel of experts sitting around a table, which may have no patient input at all. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to say we've had over 650 people register for my HD story. We've had over um, 360 who've completed all the questionnaires. It typically takes people about 45 minutes or an hour to go through the study and complete the questionnaires. Um, so we we hope to be uh, we hope to branch out soon to caregivers, people at risk, and others um, to add other modules. But uh, but right now the pilot study has just been going tremendously well. Um, one you know, interesting preliminary result we found is that we've reached people who have not been in any other kind of research, so haven't done observational, haven't done clinical trial, and we've been pretty effective in reaching uh, underrepresented groups, which was one of our goals to really involve people who, for various reasons, aren't able to participate in clinical or observational research in other ways. Mm -hmm. Sherry, anything you want to add? No, that that's great. And um, one one thing I wanted to mention is that before we did this study, we did another study called the um, HD Care Improvement Project. We were trying to figure out, and it was um, it was a study and a survey to try and figure out what the gaps are in care and how many people um, you know don't have an HD specialist and why and some of these issues and travel um, logistics were a big part of it because um, there's obviously certain areas that don't have HD, HSG sites, enroll sites, or um, you know centers of excellence. So we wanted to, um, one of the outcomes of this study was to figure out a way to engage people. And this is, um, you know, was the precursor to this platform because now we found, as Karen mentioned, that we're really engaging people um, who have never been engaged before. So that is, um, we think, kind of huge and hopefully, over time, we'll make connections for these people to see HD specialists. I mean, that is, you know, ultimately some of the goals we have. Um, so, you know, that is that's, you know, that is where we are with my HD story, and and more more um, studies will be hopefully held on this platform. Um, oh, I should I should mention also that it currently is only available in the U.S. We are definitely looking to expand to other areas, but right now. Um, if you go on the website outside of the U.S., it will not let you participate. So we are working on this. Mm -hmm. It's been amazing to see in such a 
from a public perspective, a short amount of time. Obviously, there was all of the legwork leading up to it that took years, but how engaged the community in the U.S. has been in participating, and I, I it's, it's kudos to you all for getting this up and running and to reach out to that underserved, underrepresented, uh, underrepresented community in the U.S. Thank you. The advocacy groups have just been terrific in terms of publicizing the study. Yes, couldn't do it without them. And going into another population within the HD community, speaking um, specifically about the juvenile onset HD community, Lauren, would you share a little bit about Join HD? Yeah, I think it's a nice kind of segue from my HD story as well. Um, with juvenile HD, it is so rare and understudied um, as a population for many reasons. Um, I think historically, uh, with Huntington's disease being primarily an adult onset disease. A lot of the care and centers of excellence and people specialized in HD are adult neurologists, psychiatrists, and um, we don't have very well-defined pathways from pediatrics to, to um, adult neurology or adult services. Um, it's extremely rare. It's, it's thought to be about 5% of Huntington's disease cases. Um, and the burden is extremely high in, in terms of care for these families. So the, the, the parents tend to be mothers quite often who are often caring for their partner who already has Huntington's disease or has already passed from HD and then could have one or multiple children suffering from this. So it is extremely um, hard in these families. So one, they may not be seeing any specialists or coming to what we know to be our, our centers um, of amazing researchers, clinicians that um, like Ed, like Karen, who are world experts on Huntington's disease, but not necessarily um, experts on juvenile HD. So we wanted to figure out a way that we can reach people and, and, and get this um, population heard and, and get their voices heard and to find a way that we can actually learn from these, these caregivers who are really are the experts and, and know what is actually going on for these, um, these children and young people with, with juvenile HD. So we've set up a registry, our patient registry, which is probably the most basic kind of occupational research mm -hmm. in the, that it's like a, uh, a sign-up sheet at this stage. So we have um, links all over our website and that where individuals that hear about the study can register their details and we will get in touch with them, um, make sure that they do have someone with juvenile HD um, and then they can sell, we get them a login details and they can self-enroll and self-participate. So it's really empowering these families to get their, their information out there and basically stand up and say, we're here, we exist, we're, there's more of us out there than, than you think and we really want to be included in trials and we want to have better um, care pathways and better support and so far it is already a global study so we have it, we've obviously focused on the English speaking countries because that's where our resources lie but with the amazing volunteer support that we have we're starting to translate a lot of our documents into many languages and as that comes out we will be able to get people to sign up in their own um, languages um, we've got people signed up from places that we know there is very little research like Pakistan Ukraine, Russia, um, there's one from Brazil already. So it's already starting to access, reach people that we know are not engaging in research around the world. And we hope this will be a snowball um, um, effect and hopefully get enough numbers that we can do robust, robust research in these, this community and actually get proper outcome measures that will then facilitate future trials. And treatments because right now they the juvenile patients are not being included in in our current therapeutic trials. And I think it's important to you to bring out the fact that it's for patients who have been officially diagnosed with JHD, caregivers currently caring for someone diagnosed, caregivers who have previously cared for someone diagnosed, and then also people who 
weren't technically diagnosed with JHD 20 and younger, but were showing symptoms in their 20s and probably should have been diagnosed with JHD. But we know that there are so many misdiagnoses that happen because the symptoms can seem really benign, things like learning disabilities um, or um, uh, ADHD or yeah. behavioral changes. Um, we, we purposely have made it really open. Um, we want anyone who believes that their child or young person has suffered from juvenile Huntington's disease, whether or not they've had official diagnosis from a doctor, um, because we know the delays in diagnoses, um, the ethical considerations of testing young people, minors for juvenile HD because of the um, um, ambiguity of the symptoms very early on um, and the fact that if you test someone and they, these, these symptoms don't turn out to be juvenile HD you've, and they could have a gene mutation that will make them have adult onset, you've taken away their kind of ownership of their genetic, predictive genetic process. Um, so we, we purposely made this very open because we hope we, we need to, to see people as early as possible in the disease process. And I think it will, will be really important over the years to get that information. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for, for describing that. Um, and at the, whenever we premiere this, you all will have all of this information listed in the description so you can have direct links to learn more of each of these studies. I know Sherry, you wanted to add another study that HSG is focusing on. Sure, so as I mentioned, it's called the Virtual UHDRS. Mm -hmm. So the Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale, the short version is UHDRS, um, is used by clinicians to help diagnose patients with Huntington's disease, and it's also used in clinical trials. Also used in clinical trials um, to assess people with the disease, and we are trying to um, create a virtual form of this um, scale, this assessment too, so people can be assessed at home. Um, and so we have an observational study currently um, going on with 15 sites, and so where patients will come in um, and do the scale in person, and then they get to do it at home. And so they're sent um, an iPad and there's all these technical setups. Um, they work with our technician and then they get to be assessed virtually. And so hopefully the goal is, is that this will be um, accepted by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, um, as a tool that can be used um, in clinical trials um, remotely. And that hopefully will help more people that can't get to the clinic participate in clinical trials um, or even have hybrid trials where people can do part at home and part at the clinic. Fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah, that's it's, it's amazing. And I think that the, the big push now going forward is how can we get more and more and more people engaged, um, knowing that sometimes travel is challenging or access can be challenging, which is, I think, really, a really important point. Um, it just conscientious of time here, I wanted to get through some of the concerns that we've heard from the community to just break down a little bit about um, how can they participate? Is this um, a, a concern or is it more of a myth or misunderstanding, miscommunication with what observational studies can do? Um, so one of those concerns is I'm a caregiver, so I can't participate in an observational study. Um, true or false? False. <laughs> False. It depends, false. It depends false. on the study. There's almost all observational studies have a component for caregivers and the caregiver's insight is so important to the person they're caring for. They mm -hmm. see things that, you know, maybe the person who's affected by HD doesn't see. So mm -hmm. in a way it's like a reality check, but I think most observational studies do want the caregiver input. I know for enroll and for many of the other observational studies, there is there are even informed consents for the caregiver specifically. So we really, and there are assessments like the caregiver quality of life mm -hmm. specific to the caregiver. So we really do encourage caregivers to participate as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And in the case of something like HD Clarity, if the caregiver is someone who uh, has either tested negative for the HD expansion or is someone who's a spouse or partner from a non-HD family, 
then what that makes the caregiver is a healthy control. And that means that they have potential to give us really useful information about um, what the brain and the nervous system of someone who doesn't have the HD genetic expansion looks like. So uh, in many um, HD clarity cases, we have a family member who's had a positive genetic test and a caregiver who is not at risk, and they can both give an HD they can both give it a sample for HD clarity, a sample of CSF. Um, and we use control, healthy control samples and data alongside Huntington's disease samples and data to um, help, help figure out what's HD and what is other stuff like genes, environment, diet, and all of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand with this, and I think we know the answer. I'm at risk or have tested negative. I don't qualify to participate. The answer is false. Yes. False. <laughs> and we just gave some concrete examples of that too. So um, whether you have chosen to go through genetic testing, have tested negative, um, get involved and participate because it's really important for your perspective. Um, and I just, there's a slightly broader picture here, which is that people, you know, people are hearing from us about individual projects and they might want to take part in them and go to the site and say, I want to do HD clarity or I want to do enroll HD. Can I do that? And if the answer is no to that, people shouldn't get too dispirited because many clinical sites will have their own local research studies going on or will be linked to a sister site that will have research going on. So rather than saying, I mean, it's fine to say, can I be in this study? But mm -hmm. Think about also saying, what studies can I be in? What can I do to help with the with the research? Um, can you put me on a database so that if a study comes up, you can call me or use resources like the HDSA's um, HD Research Trial Finder website, where you can put in some very limited information about yourself, including your location roughly, and then click through and you'll be given a list of nearby sites and what studies they're running that you're likely to be eligible for and contact information. So, so it's about being kind of a bit strategic and a bit open-minded about sort of tell me what I can do rather than can I do this particular thing. Not afraid to ask questions and advocate for yourself. And we talk about right. that a lot, the big A, little A, big A policy change, little A, how can I be my best advocate? And that's a huge part of it is, is being willing to put yourself out there and have those conversations. Yeah, agreed. Um, so this kind of ties in a little bit with that. Um, there's a study in my country, but I live too far away to make the trip if it has to be an actual in-person visit. And I think I'd love to hear your perspective on, um, I think that there's a lot of great examples here with surveys to participate in, um, advocating to see is there a place closer to where I live that can participate. Um, but then also, I think evaluating what you would want to give versus the travel and are you willing to make that sacrifice and I think having those conversations with the um, the investigators to say to learn more about it and then you can be more um, able to make that decision any other thoughts on on that I, I would add that um, a lot of these studies compensate for travel costs in some form or other um, some more than others um, based on kind of how much time is taken out so um definitely for things like HD clarity where you have to stay overnight in a hotel that was covered and the they um compensate quite generously um for other aspects of it so that's just an important conversation you can have with the site um to see if if it's going to be a struggle financially for you to get there there might be some way that they can help make that easier mm -hmm. right and, and it may not be that go ahead Jamie I would say they're annual visits, so it's just once a year, whether it's clarity or enroll. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't be that much of a drain on time because the travel can be co compensated for. So it wouldn't be a loss. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and if an observational study is a bit more demanding, like HD Clarity or some of the others um, that have been up and running that have involved slightly more invasive procedures, there's often also a kind of inconvenience fee to sort of recognize, which is basically a, a cash payment to recognize the inconvenience and, and sacrifice that the person has made. It's not, it's, it would be unusual for us to be able to compensate for something like loss of earnings or the need to employ a babysitter or something. But in, we do whatever we can within the financial constraints and the constraints of the ethics um, regulations in each different country to try and minimize the inconvenience and try and um, 
make taking part as easy as possible for as many people as possible. I would add, if you are um, a family member or a friend and you want to support someone who has HD, one thing you can do is enable them to be in a clinical trial. So, you know, you could be the person who drives them. You could walk their dog. You could watch their child. You could do the grocery shopping. You could bring a meal over if they can't get home to make a meal. There are lots of things that you can do to support people um, so that you can be sort of their team that lets them be part of the clinical trial. I love that. And I think, Absolutely. again, that kind of goes to what Ed was saying in the previous question with not being afraid to, to have those conversations with the scientists in the community, with the investigators, because you could simply say, I want to participate. Time is a challenge. Finances are a challenge. Or I don't have anybody to watch my kids. They have this ability to be able to say, well, have you thought of this and help you troubleshoot so you can participate? Amazing. Well, I know um, a lot of the other things that uh, that we've addressed with some of the challenges, which is um, about surveys and, and their value compared to being in a clinic and doing an observational study, which I think we've really proven the success of what HSG is doing, um, what JOIN is trying to achieve. So I think that that is, is extremely important. Um, the ability to both participate in a clinical trial and an observational study simultaneously and how that works together. Um, and I know that uh, one of the things that we always hear more from is how can I find out more? So uh, We've talked about neurologist, about HD tri uh, trial finder. What are some other, any other resources out there that you all would suggest? I would say you can go to the EHDN website to find out clinical sites for clinical care. You can go to the Enroll website to find out which sites are participating in Enroll. You can go to the HSG website to see where their accredited sites are located. So I think just at your fingertips, there are lots of resources and not all of them are conveniently located, but a lot of them are. And I think because some of these studies are only once a year, especially observational, or some of them are surveys, you don't even have to come into clinic, then you'd see what opportunities are available to you that are most convenient even if you live far away or you can't take time off work, but you can at least contribute something to research. Yeah, and also I just wanna throw a plug in. You can go online to clinicaltrials.gov mm -hmm. and type in observational studies for Huntington's disease or HD. Um, and then they should have a list that comes up of enrolling um, observational studies. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a shameless a... plug to reach out to your associations. We can connect right. even talking through right. some of these things that uh, we've got a great, this is going to age me, Rolodex information <laughs> database of, <laughs> I know, of people that we can connect you to to learn more, whether it's a personal perspective from participating in something similar or simply being able to say, hey, this is the person to talk to who's facilitating it or, or online resources available. And I wouldn't be Ed Wild if I didn't mention HD Buzz, mm -hmm. um, which is a research news uh, website, hdbuzz.net, if you haven't heard of it. And that's a that's a, uh, a resource for cl clinical research news in Huntington's disease, written by scientists. And most of the observational projects that that are uh, that are up and running or that have produced results um, will have been written about at one point or another uh, on on HD Buzz. So it's it's uh, it's often a good way to to get uh, understandable information about not only what's going on, but how observational research is really changing the game when it comes to our understanding of HD and our development of future therapeutics. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for your time today, your expertise and your tremendous dedication to the HD community. Any closing words that anyone would like to say as we wrap up today's conversation? I would just say that I really want to encourage people to get involved. There's always something you can do. And if you really feel inspired and you want to feel empowered and take that control and, you know, kind of be part of your destiny, it, it, it does feel good. Mm -hmm. You know, you're giving back to the community and people you love around you. So you're making a difference. And I think that's really important in such a wonderful community setting like Huntington's disease. And it always sometimes feels like, why do they need this much blood or why do they need this much CSF or why am I answering this question? But you know, for the years and years of data that we have, every data point counts and we are still using data from track HD, predict HD cohort things. This data is, is being cumulatively impactful for the future generations to come. So, yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for watching. Thanks to our panelists for your time. Uh, more information can be found at hdyo.org or any of these amazing resources listed. And until next time, we'll see you later. Thank you.